in discussing the granting of liberty rights through Supreme Court interpretation. Let me give you an example, a very good example of, uh, of an instance where this occurred, where uh, through interpretation, rights were expanded. In around 1960 in North Florida, a man named Clarence Gideon was charged with burglarizing a pool room. He, when he appeared before the judge, he told the judge, uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I, I need a lawyer, but I don't have any money. And the judge indicated to him, you know, Mr. Gideon, I'm sorry, but there are no funds, you know, set aside for the purpose of, of you know, paying for people's attorneys. So you'll have to do the best you can. Well, you know what happened there. Clarence Gideon, who wasn't particularly well educated and didn't really know the system that well, ended up getting convicted. Now, what he did was, was he wrote a letter, essentially, to the Supreme Court indicating that he had been convicted uh, and was in, in prison in the state of Florida and that he was facing you know, uh, uh, incarceration only because he didn't have, a, have an attorney to advance his rights. So the Supreme Court looked at this and we don't know for certain exactly how it all played out because the Supreme Court determines which cases it will take in secret. And they meet in a secret session. This is all our own policies. And they follow what's called the rule of four. If four of the justices want to hear the appeal, then the appeal will be taken, put on the docket, and the the parties will have the opportunity to, to write briefs and, a, and, and appear live and argue the case. Now, the interesting thing about Gideon's situation was, you know, his conviction was final. I mean, it was over. And he was saying, though, that he didn't get, didn't get a, a fair trial because he didn't have a lawyer. So the first thing the Supreme Court would have had to have done is, what is this letter? What do we call it? Is it just a letter? You know? Well, the Supreme Court apparently decided that it was an application for writ of habeas corpus. In other words, that he was being illegally held uh, because he was convicted in violation of a constitutional right. The Supreme Court accepted the case and gave it the name Gideon versus Wainwright. Wainwright was the name of the prison warden. In other words, this is who's holding me and that sort of thing. For the purposes of the, of the Supreme Court appeal, uh, they appointed a fine lawyer for, for Clarence Gideon who you know, made a presentation on behalf of Clarence Gideon indicating that you know, it, it's, it's fundamentally unfair for someone just because of their financial situation that they can't get an attorney in a case where they could be put in prison. Well, the Supreme Court ultimately agreed and ruled that if someone uh, is unable to afford counsel, the state, the government, will appoint a counsel for that person free of charge. Now, this applies to cases in which the person could be incarcerated. So if you get a traffic ticket and you, you, and you can only be fined and you go down there and you want a free lawyer, it's probably not going to happen, okay? But think about that. The Constitution doesn't say. It just says you have the right to counsel. It doesn't say you have a right to an attorney. And it certainly doesn't say you have a right to an attorney if you can't afford one and the government has to pay for it. So this is a significant, a significant interpretation of the Constitution by the Supreme Court of the United States in which essentially it, uh, it uh, advances one's liberty rights.
There have been many instances where the Supreme Court has, has stepped forward and given uh, interpretations, sometimes correcting itself, uh, other times dealing with, with very controversial issues. Uh, in Roe versus Wade, uh, the, the question was, does the government have the right to regulate when someone can get an abortion? This was an area that was just absolutely full of hand grenades. For one thing, you had the common law rule that said that no life existed until it was expelled from the womb. If you look at that reasoning, if that was the case, and they found you had a right to an abortion, that meant you could have a very late term abortion. Um, the question ultimately was analyzed this way. At what, what's the baseline? What are you trying to do here? And the, the decision that came down was based upon the viability of the fetus. In other words, once the, the, the closer it came to viability, the greater the authority of the state to regulate. So once it was clearly viable, the state could essentially say, you can't get an abortion. So uh, the, the, the idea was that this would be a, a mechanism in which to protect acknowledged life, if you will. Well, it's been, a, it's been a subject of controversy ever since. This is one of the examples that's used uh, by the, the traditionalists to say, this is a legislative enactment. I mean, think about it. There's nothing in the Constitution that addresses abortion. There's nothing in the Constitution that makes it based on a trimester basis. What happens, what do you do, what do you do if, if science permits uh, viability at a very early point of the pregnancy? Then what do you do? They argue that's what the legislature's for, okay? So presently, this particular decision remains in kind of a holding pattern. Uh, it's been in existence since around 1972, so it's a long-standing rule. There have been a lot of different approaches to try to chip away uh, at the decision, but it's not clear whether the Supreme Court's going to take this head on again anytime soon. Why is that? Well, you have to remember, we have a thing called the law of precedent or stare decisis. In other words, once a decision's made by the high court, other courts, the lower courts, are supposed to follow it. So the point being that there, that's what the law of precedent is. Roe versus Wade is precedent, so you better follow it. But there's been examples of where precedent has been overturned in, you know, after a period of time. So at any rate, it's not always clear that something that's going to be precedent forever, that maybe new technology, new uh, social standards, whatever it is, may affect that Supreme Court action in deciding whether something is unconstitutional or not. Now, once again, to the students, uh, the thing is, is that uh, what I suggest you do, I think would be a useful thing, is I think you ought to go and find the case on Google, uh, if you will, of Marbury versus Madison, and learn more about it, and to go and, and look at the case of Gideon versus Wainwright. Uh, you know, Clarence Gideon will be in Google, okay, and see what the real life stories were in this regard, what actually went on, what the detail of it is. Remember, every appeal court decision is a story about real things that happen to real people. So this, uh, this concludes the, the presentation for today. Thank you.